and welcome back now on the workbench today you can see this little setup here and the eagle-eyed amongst you will see that this is a little bridge rectifier arrangement uh, not a bridge rectifier component in itself but four individual diodes and um, at the back that's just a, a mains transformer 240 volts in and 15 volts out all nice and safe and secured and heat shrinked and everything else all right so this is safe this is not a mains related project not yet anyway and all this is um, leading into this Arduino why what on earth is going on with all this and what's that thing up in the top left hand corner looking a bit odd okay um, if you remember the last video we talked about that pretty dangerous fan controller and after a lot of comments and a lot of thinking about it I thought you know what let's just replace the gubbins inside yeah, yeah that's, that's the technical word for it the gubbins inside just take that board out with all its dangerous stuff and replace it with something that's one ultra safe and b in some way arduino related well this is more than arduino related believe me but i've had to um investigate and look at a few things and this is one of the first things that um i needed to get right it's it's probably one of the simplest but on the other hand it's, it's like wow that's so cool well i know i'm easily pleased so what is this well to understand what this is a zero crossing point detector what it sounds great doesn't it up there with dilithium crystal realignment antimatter chamber i know um you have to understand how the triac um or thyrista now <laughs> yes i know uh, the triac control is going to happen do you remember last time we said there was going to be a, an ac waveform and we delay switching on the triac um, until part way through the waveform so that the the, the bulb or in my case the fan doesn't get the full waveform it gets probably about let's say half of the positive cycle and then we delay again and we get about half the negative cycle so my fan will run at about half speed it's not quite that simple because you you've lost the inertia haven't you so it'd be slightly less than half but that's not important the point is it, it's a dimmer and um or fan speed controller and it, it works but in order to control that with something other than that rather dangerous Chinese contraption, um, we're going to have to use an Arduino that knows when that waveform hits the zero point. And of course, there are two zero points per complete 50 hertz cycle. Well, 60, if, if you're one of the colonials living in that funny foreign country called america is it i can't remember anyway so as the cycle goes up and down you're going to hit the zero point twice in that one cycle and we need to detect that on the arduino or whatever microcontroller you're going to use obviously when i implement this it's not going to be a full-blown arduino like this it probably won't even be a nano might be but it might not be i'd rather use something like an 80 tiny 85 or even an 80 tiny 13 because it doesn't do a lot but what it does do is like well that's cool that's really clever anyway that's that's for some time in the future now i'm going to switch this on and it quickly becomes extremely annoying as you'll find out so let me just switch a few things on and uh, we'll be right back after this message jlc pcb offers custom pcbs with fast reliable delivery but today I want to talk about their SMT and PCB assembly from just $2. Let's have a look what that consists of, shall we? So as you can see here, the PCB and SMT assembly is available from $2. How do they do that? So normally there's a $7 setup fee, but in this case they're going to give you a voucher so you don't have to spend that money. Great. All you do is pay for your components. Simple. PCB SMT assembly from $2 from JLC PCB. Why don't you try them out now? right i've plugged it all in and then my computer crashed yeah so if my top has now changed color a little bit it's because everything just went haywire it's taken me about 20 minutes to get back to this position windows it's the problem with usb3 if you plug too many things into a usb3 you run out of resources real quick and that's what happened as soon as i switched on the arduino kaboom so uh, there was a highly technical solution to that of course i just plugged it into a usb2 hub instead with the longer lead yeah i know okay so it's plugged in um you'll see at the top left there that oscilloscope was trace um, let me make that a little bit bigger for you so we can see exactly what's going on there we are so what that represents the rectified ac signal so what we're doing we're putting the the positive cycle 
on the positive supply and then the negative cycle we're switching that into a positive pulse as well hence you'll get lots of up and downs normally at this stage um, if we were making a power supply for example you'd put on a, a rather large capacitor electrolytic capacitor and if you've watched my bacon bites one on capacitors that's one of the things i mentioned about power supplies we don't use them an awful lot in arduino world so it's just a sort of a, a side mention really but uh, that's what we would do like some of these on the board here look all right uh, and just a word of warning <laughs> if you're experimenting with this sort of thing like i was yesterday um do ensure please as per the bacon bites video on capacitors i make a very strong point about you must select the correct capacitor for the job uh, in terms of both capacitance and voltage if you put a, a capacitor with a voltage that's too low um, it will probably explode as in fact this one did so as you can see the top is um it's totally gone if i put my hands there you might focus a bit better but anyway it's all split um because although this is a thousand microfarad capacitor and i thought oh that'd be ideal to get across the output you've got to remember this is a 15 volt ac and when rectified and smoothed it goes up to about 22 and guess what i think this is something like a six volt or something so yeah i put it on there and it worked for about oh a good five seconds and i heard this hissing sound and fizzing sound and then some magic smoke escape which was in fact the the steam from here and then kaboom it exploded everywhere luckily at the time i was wearing glasses so the the splatter got onto my glasses and not my newly operated on eye so let that be a warning to you pity this hadn't happened actually before i did the bacon bites thing on capacitors because that would have been a stern warning to everybody yeah anyway i've got some more on order now with much higher voltages so i can play about in the future but we don't need to smooth this supply and that's the last thing we want to do because we want to get on here see where it goes down to zero every time there and there and at the front again all right so that's happening every um half cycle so we're getting a hundred of these pulses at zero um for every second well in the uk in the united states it's um, 60 hertz so you get 120 pulses now and i don't know why we've got different frequencies of mains but there we are now if i plug the beeper back in um so you'll hear exactly what this is doing and hopefully it won't be too annoying that's beeping every second and i do mean every second to the to the millisecond all right because what we're doing we're detecting via this interrupt pin this one this orange orange cable here look it's going into pin two of the arduino and that's you can only use pin two or pin three on the arduino uno and nano other variants will have different pins and uh, i'm just going to disconnect that again because it's driving me nuts right so every one hundredth of a second the arduino is detecting on pin two the zero point here all right so it's detecting that or the next one or whatever right so it's going oh it's gone down to zero i'll do something and then when it's counted up a hundred of those it goes well that's it that's the second i'll beep just to annoy ralph and all his viewers all right but it's just to prove the point um now the code is simplistic itself and it's a really good way to learn about interrupts really because it's a really simple thing to do isn't it now why do we need to do all this well this is like step one of learning how to control a triac the arduino needs to know when the zero pulse is so it can turn on the triac at that point or at least start counting the delay that it wants from that point and go right i'll just wait you know five milliseconds before i allow the triac to switch on and therefore the light or the fan or whatever but that's that's for another video let's have a look at the code for this then how to detect these pulses 100 times a second on the arduino simplicity itself right this is the code we've got the um, the zero point detector here on pin two as i say you can use pin two or pin three doesn't matter uh, i've got my beeper on 11 it's just the one that's convenient for me to plug into 11 and ground on that side the pins are that far apart it just works nicely um, i've got a counter here that we count in the interrupt routine in case you're not quite clear on this when we have an external interrupt on pin two that is a hardware interrupt something happens and the microcontroller immediately does what you've told it to do so it, it stores everything else its registers right in memory and goes right i'm now 
jumping into this routine you've told me, do whatever I've got to do in there, come back out, restore everything I had previously, and carry on. All right, so unlike, say, with Windows or anything that has an operating system, the Mac OS, Raspberry Pi, yes, you can have hardware interrupts, but the operating system says, yeah, all right, I've, I've detected that there was a hardware interrupt, but it's not convenient at the moment. I'm doing something. So there might be a little delay there of a, of a millisecond or two. Could be longer, who knows. The, on Windows, for example, and I guess the Mac as well, the mouse interrupt, as you move the mouse about your workspace, um, I think the interrupt there is 18 times a second to make it nice and smooth. So every time you move the mouse, but how often have you noticed as you move the mouse around, occasionally it stutters or stops because Windows is busy doing something else at that instant, it might be loading a graphic or whatever. The operating system is not allowing that interrupt to happen just at that point. And then, of course, it, it does, and there's loads of interrupts all built up, so suddenly your mouse leaps from one point to where it should be in a, in a fraction of a second. And that's the difference between an operating system interrupt, or handling the interrupt, and the Arduino, where it just, it just happens. There's nothing else happening that could possibly interrupt that. <laughs> no pun intended. So the, the interrupt is serviced straight away. Right, so in our interrupt service routine, what we're doing, we're going to increment this zero point counter all right now it's volatile and we'll talk about what that means and why we've got it volatile when we get down there uh, now because i'm using a non-arduino ide i do have to declare my functions ahead of time otherwise the compiler says oi what do you mean by zero point detect i can't find it the, Ardu the arduino ide allows you just to write them any old place and it will find them it must do a scan first i suppose anyway so the setup Okay, I've had um, I did put the debug window on, but that was equally annoying having something flash up every second, so I've not put that out. Um, the the beeper, okay, that's an output pin. I say do a beep when we first start up, just so we know it's working. Um, zero is the zero point counter because we haven't counted yet, and this is how you set up an interrupt. Um, the interrupt pin is well, it's an input. And I've said it's an input pull up because if you don't, if you haven't connected anything to that input yet, so pin two, it's sort of floating about just doing its own thing. And of course, it can trigger quite well randomly, quite honestly, and it's quite annoying. So by putting an input pull up, it raises the pin up via a very weak internal resistor to the plus five, and it will stop it triggering until something really does bring it low. And this is how you attach the interrupt. So you attach interrupt. Um, you should always use this format now, digital pin to interrupt, and then the number of the actual pin. Don't start putting in the actual interrupt pin, zero or one, because it's, it's all magic numbers again, and people don't understand it. They're going, oh, why are you putting in pin zero? And you go, no, no, it's not pin zero, it's interrupt zero. And it's, oh, just do it this way. This is the way that Arduino themselves say, look, this is, this is the way to do it, okay? Makes it so much easier. So we're saying the digital pin interrupt is pin two, uh, this is the routine I want you to run when it is interrupted, and I want you to interrupt on a falling waveform. Now, let's have a little think about this. You would think it should be low there, shouldn't you? Because I want you to trigger when you're actually at zero. Except when I put low in there, it was just triggering, you know, a thousand times a second. Um, I'm not sure why, but I've had problems similar when it's low for like um, rotary encoders. Um, I don't know why. So um, in this particular instance, I've said falling. So as the waveform comes back down and it, it drops below the 2 volt marker or 2.2 or whatever the threshold is for a, what's low and what's high in the Arduino world, it goes, ah, I'm falling, I'll trigger. Okay, and it won't then re-trigger until it goes above what's, what's considered to be a high, which is probably about 3 volts-ish. Okay, so that's that's the way we should always declare an interrupt. And that's the end of the setup routine. So uh, we'll skip over the loop, we'll come back to that, and we won't look at the beep. All the beep does is just set the, the pin 11 high for a fraction of a second, and then delays of 40 milliseconds, and then goes low. So it's just a beep that we can hear. That's not the interesting bit. Right, so the, um, the zero point detect, this is the interrupt service routine, the ISR now. All it's doing, is counting up a value and that's that's all it does so every hundredth of a second or in other words hundred times a second it's it's forced to go into this routine it counts up the 
this this zero point that it's detected and exit and that is that is probably the best sort of interrupt service routine you can get something that's that's fast and in and out again can you imagine if we delayed in here we'd miss pulses wouldn't we because this is happening a hundred times a second if i put a delay uh i don't know 100 so that's 100 milliseconds i mean we're gonna we're gonna miss so many pulses five pulses we're never gonna get it right so we do as little work as we can in an interrupt service routine and then we let the loop take care of everything else so what i'm saying in the loop now which is you know just running through its thing a few thousand times a second but it can be interrupted and just suspended for a little while while the interrupt service routine runs and then carries on without affecting the interrupt service routine what we're saying here is if it's 90, greater than 99 in other words 100 or more just in case i did miss one haven't yet though uh, zero is the counter and we need to do that immediately we can't can't wait for that because obviously in another 20 milliseconds we're going to get another pulse so we immediately zero eyes it and then do the beep if you do the beep first the beep has a delay of 40 milliseconds in it, doesn't it? And then it zeroizes it. So we'll already have started to count up for the next cycle before it zeroizes it. Things get totally out of hand. So timing is essential here. So we zeroize it, do the beep, by which time we've probably already counted up, you know, half a dozen zero points, and that's it. Now, why volatile? Yep, all you beginners out there on interrupt service routines, this is important. The zero point detection routine here just says add one to that that value now the thing is the arduino compiler says ah the zero point counter oh yes i was just using that just a second ago well a microsecond ago um i've got it here in my register i'll, ju I'll just add one to that no 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 we don't want that to happen because all for all we know we've zeroized it at this point here and the two now do not match up. The memory location and the register location have, in fact, two different values because it's being done behind the scenes. So we say this variable is considered volatile. That is subject to change without you even realizing it's changed, Mr. Compiler, or more to the point, this routine here. So when it sees this value, it goes, ah, that's volatile. I must not rely on any value that I've previously retrieved from memory and put into register. I must go to the memory location, retrieve it into my register, increment it and put it back. OK, so that we're always looking here at the right value. Well, we're looking here, actually, aren't we? And then resetting it here. But it will always write back to the memory rather than a register. And yes, it does incur a minute speed penalty doesn't it because under normal circumstances the compiler knows if it's retrieved something from memory put it into a register and is working on it in the register it's safe and valid to do so it happens all the time registers are quick and it'll have many registers running at any one time but in this case we've got to say no you've actually got to go and write it back to memory or read it from memory with all the speed penalty that that incurs. But when I say speed penalty, I mean, we're talking, you know, microseconds to do it, but it is slower than just doing it from a, a register. So that's that's it. There is no more code. So all we're doing is counting up here, all the, the zero crossings, and when it's um, 100, it beeps. So we'll just go back to the, um, the workbench again. And uh, all of my... Oscilloscope's gone off. So long we've been spent talking. There it is. Yeah, it's a very noisy waveform, isn't it? Very noisy. I'd expect that to have been lovely and smooth and, you know, without all these jaggedy bits. All these bits here, look. Ooh, all this noise. I have no idea why we got so much noise on here. But anyway, let's um, just connect the beeper again. So that's the Arduino counting up a hundred of these zero points and going, ah, it's greater than 99. I'm resetting the counter and I'm issuing a beep so that you can hear it. And that's it. So that's the very first step in zero point um, detection. So I'm going to put this into my major project then to do that, um, you know, the gubbins replace it. No, I'm not. And there's a good reason for that. Here, using that transformer, everything is all nice and safe, isn't it? Because I'm only working on 15 volts AC and it's all insulated from the mains. There's no mains here. I can touch anything here. I wouldn't recommend putting your tongue across it you get a tingle but yeah it's safe um but in the real world when we make this project 
we are not going to have a transformer, not for the zero point detection anyway. We'll just have a, a connection directly to mains via a resistor uh, and then via an opto isolator or opto coupler, it's also known as. So in the real world, then in the fi in the final project, as it will be, we'll have our line and neutral coming in. So in my case, that's 240 volts AC. That will go via a resistor to an opto coupler and then via another resistor back to the neutral line. And these will probably be in the region of about 47K. I did some working out, but I can't remember exactly. Anyway, inside this opto coupler, we actually have two LEDs. So one biased that way and one the other way like that and these are both light emitting diodes now they're going to be turning a little transistor on an opto transistor so there it is so we have two outputs here and what happens is as the live voltage goes through here on every half cycle one of these leds will be turning on and flickering just briefly and then off again so we get the same amount of pulses just as you store on that oscilloscope like that more or less so if we take this one to a safe vcc of say plus five volts and this one down to a safe ground and all this is galvanically isolated so there's no no connection at all between this half of the circuit and this half keep the mains out to one side then we can take a tapping here and send that to pin two on the interrupt and get exactly the same result as what you saw in the video today well that's the theory anyway so um, that's probably about it um, on how we're going to zero detect it's it's pretty straightforward it's interesting to realize that your interrupt routine is being handled a hundred times a second and the Arduino of course keeps up with that absolutely no trouble it's a walk in the park for an Arduino it's no trouble so We'll leave it there. Um, there's a couple of other things I want to talk to you about, though, not associated with this necessary. If you're interested, keep tuned. And uh, OK, let's uh, let's clear the decks, tidy up a bit, switch off the oscilloscope and talk about a few other things. Right. Very, very quick update on the smartphone charger, right, which you can see behind me here and blinking away. Uh, I had the PCB back from JLC PCB. No problem there. So it's upside down. Huh okay so that's okay and um, I've, what I did to sort of test it out as a prototype is to put pin headers in all these places where I'm going to stick things into not solder it directly there because then you can't correct it can you if things go wrong so that's what this is that all these things here on here they've all gone into little sockets so that one that one that one that shouldn't be that way up. Obviously, it's going to be flat, but that, they're the way the pins that are on there at the moment. This is the HCO5, that terrible thing that took me forever to get organized, the Bluetooth module. And uh, yeah, it, let me plug it in or let me connect up at least this. So if I load up this smart charger, that Bluetooth thing should connect. There it is. And it's coming up and it says charge. So it's it's done all that all in you know a few seconds, isn't it? Um, now, even though I'm using, as you can see here, a USB socket both in and out uh, on here just for testing. It just makes testing a lot easier. I've still got about 680. I've had it up to, I think it was 700, 800, something like that, just with these sockets. But I don't tend to do that with the actual unit. So the next step for this board is now to solder all these individual components or the equivalents of all these components directly onto this pcb so it's all nice and flat then i'm going to mount it on a piece of perspex that's the same well it's a coaster in fact it's an acrylic coaster so i'm, I'm just looking around i've put them all away to be safe because i wasn't expecting to show this but it's the same size as this one here right this is a standard cork based coaster so it's pretty much the same size so this is going to be mounted on there with the screen up the front angled as you just saw in this one here so you can read it easily even though the angle on here the reading angle is pretty good actually but even so it's better like that and um, yeah get it all screwed and bolted down and then another coaster on top and then this phone in its current stand like that will sit on top okay that's it then so finished um, any comments you want to make oh, about the phone charger or about the zero detection 
for the AC mains trike project that's yet to come. I'm waiting for some hardware actually from China, which is probably a bit of a bad idea, wasn't it? Given the current situation, it'd probably take weeks. But and there we are. That's what we've got to do. Okay, comments for either of those then. And um, yeah, if you think it was interesting and entertaining, give me a thumbs up, please, because YouTube like that, not me, YouTube do. Well, I like it too, actually, yes, I must admit. And um, see you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.